pleasure to be sharing. My name is Joseph Gerson, and it's my privilege and pleasure to be chairing today's conference, Transnational Dialogue on Nuclear Power Plant Decommissioning. Let me begin with a tip of the proverbial hat to the co-sponsors of today's conference, who after many meetings have organized the conference. Beyond Nuclear, Campaign for Peace, Disarmament and Common Security, Cape Downwinders, Citizens Action Network, C10, uh, it's the C10 Research and Education Foundation, the International Peace Bureau, Massachusetts Peace Action, the Public Council of the South Coast of the Gulf of Finland. Our expectation is that we'll be able to learn from one another and build ties that will endure in a, into a more peaceful and safe future. We are excited to have a number of expert OBLAST and local officials and conscientious community-based activists as our authoritative speakers today. We have chosen to focus on two regions in Russia and the US, North, Northwest Russia and New England. Both regions have commercial nuclear power plants that are either closed or decommissioning, while some nuclear power plants are looking to extend their operational life, often a great danger to the surrounding communities and maybe the nations. Ideally, decommissioning should ensure the transfer, the safe transfer of these facilities uh, to a state that will be environmentally safe for present and future generations. But what actually happens? Why is the public largely excluded from this process? And what opportunities can decommissioning uh, provide to inform the safety condition of reactors still operating or seeking licensing extensions? These are some of the themes we will be examining today. A few words about today's format. Let me take this down for a second here. A few words about today's format. The conference is organized around three panels with short breaks between the panels, in part so our wonderful interpreter can catch her breath a little bit and then take on the next, the next round. First will be our experience and knowledge of the environmental hazards of decommissioning. Then we'll turn to the hazards and opportunities inherent in decommissioning, and we'll close with uh, uh, openings for public engagement in the decommissioning process. There will be a question and answer period after each, pa uh, each panel. It may be shorter than we like, but we'll do our best to get as many of your questions in as possible. There is a, Q a question and answer period, as I said that. Please type your questions into the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we won't be able to access the chat in this uh, webinar, uh, so please use the Q&A uh, function for questions. And to make it easy for uh, um, uh, Linda Pence Guttner and um, uh, Nate Trumbull, who will be uh, asking those questions and looking to see which questions should be asked, please limit what you put into the Q&A uh, function uh, just to questions so it doesn't make it difficult for them. Um, got that. Uh, and to simply to say that uh, your questions will be, in, uh, will be uh, translated by our interpreter uh, and uh, Nat will be uh, translating the questions coming from Russian participants uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the conference. Uh, the focus of the event, and I want to stress this, the focus of the event is on civil society engagement rather than technical aspects of decommissioning and how to achieve a more uh, open and democratic process. We will not be addressing any international political issues, and we have joined together in an endeavor to overcome geopolitical enmity to engage in open dialogue with civil society colleagues uh, who have in common an interest for the protection of our shared global environment. Before I introduce today's first panel, we will provide a brief overview in Russian and English of what nuclear power plant decommissioning means in our respective countries. To that end, we have uh, Sarah Abramson, the executive director of the C10 Research and Education uh, Foundation, and Oleg Bodrov, an engineer physicist and chairman of the Public Council of the South Coast of, uh, of Gulf of Finland. So Sarah, it is to you. Okay, I will share my screen. So this background is what 
is published by the government on what decommissioning means and how the public can be involved. And you'll hear from panelists today that have real lived experiences through decommissioning that is going to differ from what is written on paper. So what does the US government say? And it's going to come from the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC, whose legally mandated job is to protect people and the environment as it relates to commercial nuclear power. So the process is these five generic steps from notifying the public that the shutdown is going to happen to actually turning it off and uh, making it safe, uh, which is about two years uh, to start the work. Step three is coming up with a detailed license termination plan and the decommissioning plan and getting that approved by the NRC. And then step four is implementing the plan. That's going to be the long pole in the tent thing that takes the longest. And then at the very end of all of these processes, uh, the decommissioning should be complete and it's supposed to take no more than 60 years. There are different options that decommissioning companies can choose from to decommission a nuclear power plant. Uh, the two are Safe Store and Decon. They differ a little bit. Um, Safe Store is often referred to as dismantling. Uh, that's when the facility is maintained and monitored in a condition that allows the radioactivity to still be contained while it decays and theoretically becomes less radioactive. Um, decon is tearing down the whole structure and getting everything out of the property uh, that has potential radioactivity. Of the 26 uh, reactors that have been decommissioned in the US so far, or are in the process of doing so, 10 have selected that safe store option and 16 have selected that decon full dismantling option. So the NRC expresses good intentions on their website and what they say in public statements about what the public participation should look like in a decommissioning. Um, they use uh, an approach to open government and there's lots of um, descriptions that they will put out about uh, their desire to create broad access for the public to be involved. What are the written opportunities that are legally required to be available to the public to involve themselves during a decommissioning? Uh, well, we talked about the steps. At step two, when that reactor is uh, being turned off, that can take up to two years. Uh, at the completion of that step, there's supposed to be a public hearing that is, takes place at a location close to the nuclear power plant so the local community can attend. Uh, and then there's a similar meeting held at the end of that third step, which is when the plan had already has already been created and approved by the NRC. So at these stages, the public is sort of um, just receiving the news and not really participating in the decision. Um, and then if there are any amendments to any of the plans throughout the process, like if they come up with um, encounter barriers or financial troubles and they need to change their plan, then a hearing has to be scheduled after that uh, those amendments have been uh, approved by the NRC. And then if the community is loud enough, which a lot of the folks in this room are brave and <laughs> capable of being loud enough, then you'll get an additional meeting. Um, and the NRC actually makes this statement that um, the NRC may hold more meetings if local interest is high. Uh, there's also the Nuclear Decommissioning Committee Advisory Panel, NDCAP. You might hear that term a lot during this webinar. Um, different communities that are, you're going to hear from today, that is their outlet, uh, a monthly meeting, sometimes a quarterly meeting, where they are able to get in the room with the decision makers and express how they feel about the ongoing decommissioning of the plant. So we got just about another minute, if that. Okay, perfect. This is my last slide. So the public is allowed in the room, sometimes. But as you'll hear today, uh, are we really being heard? And these images are supposed to sort of portray a little bit of um, how we feel uh, when it comes down for the decommissioning to actually take place. And I'll pass it off to Oleg. Thank you, Sarah. Oleg, you're on. Уважаемые коллеги, я добавлю достаточно полный э, обзор, что такое вывод из эксплуатации моей американской коллеги. И хочу сказать, что 
Вывод из эксплуатации – это завершающий этап жизненного цикла любой ядерной и радиационно опасной установки. Вы знаете, существуют принципы устойчивого развития, и вывод из эксплуатации должен отвечать этим принципам, которые утверждены Организацией Объединенных Наций. И этот вывод из эксплуатации должен быть экономически эффективным, экологически безопасным и социально приемлемым. Вот эти качества, которым должен отвечать процесс вывода из эксплуатации. И хочу добавить, что это должно касаться не только тех мест, где находится атомная станция, но и тех мест, где происходит переработка или окончательная изоляция отработавшего ядерного топлива и радиоактивных отходов. И при этом безопасность должна обеспечиваться не только для нынешнего, но и для будущих поколений. В настоящее время в России работает 11 атомных электростанций, на которых функционирует 37 ядерных блоков. Примерно 60% атомных блоков российских АЭС выработали проектный ресурс, но продолжают работать. Это достаточно серьезные риски, которые, с моей точки зрения, недостаточно хорошо анализируются. Несколько лет назад с Андреем Талевлиным, моим коллегой и партнером, мы попытались добиться того, чтобы проводились слушания перед тем, как продлевать ресурс, предусмотр... ресурс атомной станции, предусмотренный проектировщиками. Но суд отказался предоставить такую возможность, и правила с тех пор были изменены. Теперь продление ресурса происходит только после консультации с регулятором, и общественность не может влиять на этот процесс. Во всяком случае, каких-то механизмов юридических не существует. И в ближайшие 10 лет должен начаться вывод из эксплуатации 18 российских энергоблоков. Это много, и это замечательно, что мы сегодня обсуждаем эту тему. И хочу сказать, что сегодня же Завершается конференция МАГАТЭ, которая посвящена выводу из эксплуатации. Если в Вене обсуждаются технические, технологические моменты, то мы с вами должны дополнить этот процесс участием общественности. Я считаю, что это очень важный этап и важная роль которая должна принадлежать общественности. Всего доброго. Я закончил. Thank you, Oleg. That was a very helpful. I think both you and Sarah kind of laid out what the situation is supposed to be and point us in the direction of why it's not working and the need for us to be be be, be pressing. Let me then introduce our first panel, uh, which is about the known environmental hazards of decommissioning. Uh, in our current experience. Uh, as we begin, uh, let, the, let me remind them about the need to respect uh, time. Uh, I hate being the timekeeper, but we need to keep, keep on time. Um, so let me, uh, let me, I'll introduce all three of our speakers uh, and then we'll, in, in the order in which they'll be speaking. Uh, first will be Deborah Katz, the Executive Director of Citizens Awareness Network, a nonprofit grassroots New England organization fighting for clean air, democracy, and environmental justice. Uh, CAN was instrumental in the closure of reactors in Massachusetts, Vermont, and Connecticut. Uh, she designed the community health study uh, with the Massachusetts Department of Health, uh, organized local community participation, and secured pro bono support from the Harvard School of Public Health and others. Um, so uh, thank you, Deb, for being uh, with us. Uh, second will be Sarah Abramson. Uh, you've just heard her. Uh, she is the executive director of C10 Research and Education Foundation, which focuses on the public and environmental safety 
of the surrounding uh, area around Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, truth in um, advertising, uh, I worked with a number of people back when the, that, that plant was being created. Uh, and at a high point, uh, 1,414 people uh, were arrested uh, trying to uh, protect the safety of the region by preventing the, the construction of the plant. Uh, our third panel speaker, uh, who you also have just heard, is Oleg Bodrov. He is an engineer physicist, environmentalist, and chairman of the Public Council of the South Coast of the Gulf of Finland uh, in St. Petersburg in Russia. Oleg is uh, one of the leaders of the Russian peace, environmental protection, and safety movements. And I know he's always been willing to push the limits uh, to do what he can for public safety. Oleg's talk has already been videotaped, uh, and so we'll see a video, but he will be available for questions in the Q&A period afterwards. So with that, let me turn- oh, uh, Sorry to interrupt you, this is Linda. It's Henrietta who's the speaker in this segment, not Sarah. So you may wanna just back up a minute and introduce her instead. Uh, merci beaucoup, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we, we changed orders a number of times and the question was which paper I was working on, so I apologize. So Henrietta, uh, Cosentino sits on the board of the Plymouth Area League of Women Voters uh, and the steering committee of the Save Our Bay, Massachusetts. Uh, she is a panelist on the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel uh, and a, a steadfast uh, organizer. And to add that um, some of her incentives for uh, doing what she does now uh, grows from her experiences of duck and cover uh, when we were all kids, uh, fearing nuclear a nuclear attack, uh, and uh, her brother died of cancer, uh, quite, possibly, quite, possibly. quite possibly from fallout of the nuclear tests. So with that, uh, let me turn it over, I guess, to, to Henrietta first. Sorry about now, that. No, to, to Deb. It's Deb who starts. My, 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 my apologies, I'm sorry. It, it's okay. So, Hi, my name is Deb Katz. I said I'm the executive director of Citizens Awareness Network, a New England grassroots regional group. I'm here to talk about decommissioning, but first a brief history of what my community experienced. My town was host to the first commercial reactor in America, the Yankee Row Reactor. Why my town? Because we're a working poor farming community in Western Massachusetts. The reactors sat on the banks of the Deerfield River that winds through nine small towns in our valley. Many promises were made to my community, many broken. Yankee Atomic Rose owner maintained that the reactor was safe, non-polluting, and that when it shuttered, the site would be returned to its former beauty. None of this was true. The reactor routinely released radioactive waste into the, our river, a river where our kids swim, where we fish and boat in water we use to irrigate crops and drought. Our schools are on the banks of this river. The company cooled the reactor with river water, sucking hundreds of millions of gallons of water every day, only to return heated water, undermining the river and destroying aquatic life. Yankee Atomic controlled our river. It undermined our lives and bought our people's silence by donating much needed services like ambulances, school computers, and science classes. People were afraid to speak openly. Those that did were threatened, ostracized, or worse. We suffered an epidemic of disease in cancers, a tenfold increase in children with Down syndrome, high rates of miscarriage, heart disease, immune deficiency diseases, and children with disabilities. Less than 8,000 people live in our valley. There shouldn't be any statistical significance. Our community suffered an unbearable assault. This is a broken promise of routine operation. For all its claims, nuclear power is neither clean nor green. It's a dirty technology. It relies on its invisibility to keep its lies going. And when its lies fail, its intimidation fails, it falls back on a captive regulator to protect it. After we forced Bro's closure, the failed policy regarding nuclear waste was exposed. The contamination was so widespread that the site has yet to be released some 30 years later 
for what NRC calls unrestricted use. There were plumes of tritium that migrated 300 feet down into the groundwater. There was also substantial PCB contamination. With closure, Yankee announced it would ship its low-level waste over 900 miles to Barnwell, South Carolina, a 46% working poor Black community. How could we accept the waste that hurt us could hurt another? We fought those shipments, raising awareness about the industry's environmental racism. We thought when Roe closed that our exposure to its waste would end, but no. The corporation continued to contaminate our river. We decided we had to stop it. Yankee Atomic submitted a 300 page decommissioning plan seeking approval from the NRC before cleanup could begin. Instead of waiting, it began a rapid dismantlement, basically stripping and shipping the waste to South Carolina. NRC hadn't approved the plan, yet it allowed the corporation to remove highly contaminated components without adequate review or oversight. NRC's actions were illegal. We couldn't accept NRC evading its own rules to protect Yankee Atomic. We took NRC to district court seeking an injunction to halt their stripping without an approved plan. The court rejected our petition, allowing Yankee to continue its illegal operations. However, Judge Ponzer wrote a telling opinion that holds to this day. The court makes this decision with a heavy heart. The plaintiffs have been diligently attempting for months to get a hearing on the appropriateness and competence of the NRC's actions. Many of them live near the site of the decommissioned nuclear plant. They and their families are the most directly at risk if the job of removing contaminated materials is bungled. Moreover, if they do suffer harm, its full extent may not be known for years or decades. This course of conduct suggests a concerted bureaucratic effort to thwart the efforts of local citizens to be heard about an event that vitally affects them and their children. It calls to mind the activities of Charles Dickens' fictional Office of Circumlocution in Bleak House. The prospect that this tactic may be used nationally as more nuclear power plants shut down and more local citizen groups express concern about the impacts of the process on their lives is to put it mildly disquieting. We appeal to the First Circuit Appellate Court. The court found in our favor, NRC was in violation of the National Environmental Pro Policy Act, that's NEPA, the Administrative Procedures Act, and the Atomic Energy Act. Han got the hearing we fought so hard for, but by then, Yankees shipped 140,000 curies of waste to Barnwell. While we wound our way through the court, NRC rewrote its rules to make legal what was illegal. We counted on NRC to regulate the industry with rigor, applying a standard of reasonable protection and providing a meaningful opportunity to participate in decisions that affect our welfare. CAN subsequently intervened in the decommissioning process for Connecticut Yankee to no avail. NRC's new rule appeared to eviscerate our ability for meaningful participation. With Vermont Yankees closure, Vermont supported by the states of Massachusetts and New York requested a hearing on a host of issues, decommissioning funds, cleanup, emergency planning, to no avail. Han worked with the state of Vermont to negotiate with Entergy to ensure a degree of public participation with the creation of the state-run decommissioning panel. Deborah, I need to ask you to wrap up. So de decommissioning demonstrates the colossal failure of nuclear power. Basically, the NRC has eviscerated the rules and regulations to protect people. And that the work at this point is that the industry and the nuclear industry have, uh, and the federal government have created a sham and a way to once again protect the nuclear industry from... Uh, any real public participation. Deb, I'm sorry to have to uh, interrupt. It was a, a chilling, chilling um, report. And thank you, thank you very much for it. We'll see how we build from it. But uh, 
but thank you very much. Uh, then next we turn to properly this time, Henrietta. That, thank you, Joseph. And uh, my goodness, that was indeed chilling. Can I have the first slide, please? Is uh, Sean there? Yep, just one second, I'm pulling it okay. up. Yes, so what Deborah has said really does illustrate my very first point, which is that our government outsources nuclear plant, nuclear plant ownership nodes. Go back, please, to the first page. Yes, okay. So our government outsources all of this nuclear plant ownership management and decommissioning to private corporations whose ultimate loyalty is, loyalty is not to us, but to their bottom line, which is profit. They value their shareholders, not the real stakeholders. That is the original and overarching hazard at all nuclear power plants in the United States, both uh, during operation and during decommissioning. Now here in Plymouth, Pilgrim's decommissioning was awarded to Holtec, an aggressively profit-seeking corporation that had never decommissioned a nuclear power plant before. Like the Pilgrims in 1620, Holtec had to spend its first year learning what to do. Specific decommissioning hazards at Pilgrim now include the insecurity of the site, the vulnerability of the dry casks, the dilemma of nuclear wastewater, and the insecurity of the decommissioning trust fund. And always there is entropy, things and people wear out, humans err, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is captured by the industry it's supposed to regulate. This is the larger context of what fo follows everything. Slide two, please. So Plymouth is known as America's hometown, thanks to the pilgrims who first settled here in 1620. And uh, visitors and summer people come for the history and, and the treasures of Cape Cod Bay, whale watching, marine recreation, seafood, real estate. A bungled decommission puts all this at risk, our health, our environment, and the blue economy of the South Shore valued at $2 billion a year. Now left you see the original Pilgrim Village of the 1620s as replicated at Plymouth Patuxent Museum, two miles south of Plymouth, Lock, uh, Plymouth Rock along the co coast road. And back there you can see the bay. Now a little further south and tucked into a bay out of sight lies Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station started up in 1972 by Boston Edison, taken over in the late 90s by Energy, at shut down in June of 2019 and officially transferred to Holtec in August of that year. The second uh, nuclear pilgrimage collapsed. The cost was too great. Um, so America's hometown is now home to 800 tons of irradiated spent fuel, not to mention lower, lower level nuclear waste. The permanent storage site promised by the federal government never materialized, so we may be home to a permanent nuclear waste dump. Recently, our state sen senators Moran and O'Connor wrote, since the decommissioning of Plymouth's nuclear power plant is only one of Holtec's decommissioning projects across the country, it's important not only for Plymouth and South Coast, but for the rest of the country that we get it right. And the first step is for Holtec to provide full transparency, alas. Lack of transparency afflicts not only the industry, but federal and state government as well. Distressing information gets withheld. For example, in August 2020, in a breach of protocol, six pilgrim workers received excessive doses of airborne radiation. This was not reported on the NRC website until two years later, more than two years, November 2022, and it only came to public notice this February. The NRC dubbed it of low safety significance and issued no citation. This is typical. Violations are undisclosed, then revealed and dismissed as insignificant. Ironically, major financial hazard was hiding in plain sight. Holtec's decommissioning roadmap, its PSDAR, projected zero inflation and zero costs for fuel management from now until, well, after 2016, nothing for fuel management, assuming 
that all dry cask would be magically wafted to a permanent store, storage facility that doesn't exist. A court challenge to this obvious misinformation and a disinformation was dismissed. Um, in its PSDAR, Holtec built in standard profit, profit of 30%. Meanwhile, it buffered itself from liability by creating two subsidiary lit limited liability corporations to designate as pilgrims, owners, and operators. Neither held any op uh, assets other than the decommissioning trust fund of 1.03 billion funded by us, the, the ratepayers. Then the NRC granted Holtec a waiver to use our trust fund for the cost of dry cask storage maintenance. Holtec can sue the Department of Energy for recovery of those costs, yet it is not obligated to return the recovered monies to our trust fund. So funds intended for site cleanup are diverted to dry cask storage, but the funds reimbursed to Holtec end up in Holtec's pocket. Holtec's end of year financial report just filed with the NRC March 31st revealed that our trust fund had lost substantial value last year. In consequence, Holtec has updated its schedule and announced a four year delay in completion of decommissioning. And we worry now that funds will run out before the site has been cleaned up. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. Dry casts are stored on concrete storage pads called ISFACES, independent spent fuel storage installations. Obviously, dry cask storage must be kept safe from threats both natural and human. The first storage pad built about a decade ago was situated 100 yards from shore. Many warned that rising seas would, seas would cover the casks by the end of this century. But, and so as a concession to stakeholders, quote unquote, Entergy offered to move it to higher ground further from the shore. This you see is the new storage pad. On the left, you see it as it looked in June of 2021 from a trespasser's point of view up close with about 12 casks. On the right, you see it from the public roadway, 262 feet, about a football field's length away from the public road. It's above ground, barely shielded from view, vulnerable from air as well as, as well as land, and within easy range for shoulder-held weapons. By December of 2121, this storage pad held 62 casks of spent fuel, each containing at least half as much cesium-137 as was released at Chernobyl, Multiply that by 62 ca casks. Next slide, please. Here you see Holtec's High Storm 100 system composed of an inner multi purpose canister of stainless steel and a, and a thick overpack of cement sheathed in very thin steel with a heavy bolted lid and vents for air circulation and heat dispersal. A single canister typically holds 68 assemblies. Swiss and German spent fuel containers feature walls 10 to 20 inches thick. The walls on ours are one half inch. Stress corrosion is always a problem, especially in a marine environment. And the NRC admits that can canisters may crack within 30 years. They are warranted for 25 and licensed for above 60, original license with an extension. And the ingredients are toxic for millennia. This is insanity. There is no known technology to inspect, repair, or replace cracked canisters. The oldest Holtec cask is less than 30 years old, so there's no basis for claiming that they will remain safe for over a century, which is what Holtec claims. And when they leak, Holtec CEO suggests the Russian doll solution. Uh, this might amuse our Russian colleagues. It's another overpack. But no overpack has yet been manufactured for this system of casks, let alone approved for use. And it's not anywhere to be seen. As for monitoring, there are over two dozen dosimeters, thermal luminescent ones, placed around town, even one by Plymouth Rock. And they are read quarterly, every three months, to see how much total radiation just might have escaped. The only daily inspections required are visual ones. 
to assure that vents aren't blocked. Um, and the aging man management plan kicks in in 2034 and requires inspection of a single cask every five years, always the same cask and not even necessarily in Plymouth. As the casks deteriorate, the inspections decrease, go figure. It is assumed the cask will be gone by 2016 or 20, 2062 or, or 64, but to transfer a faulty cask to a sturdier system would require either a spent fuel pool for immersion, and that will be gone in a few years, or a dry hot cell that we do not have. Proposed legislation on Beacon Hill would mandate real-time monitoring for helium, heat, and radiation. And this, at least, is possible with current technology and reasonable in cost. We cross our fingers. Slide five, please. Henrietta, you've got another minute here. Okay. What to do with 1.1 million gallons of chemically radio radioactively contaminated water in various parts of the reactor building is our biggest question right now. The NRC allows four options, evaporate, store on site, ship to a licensed Radwake site, or discharge it into Cape Cod Bay. Holtec plans the latter. It's cheap and easy compared to other options. It won't cut into profits, but according to state law, it is illegal. And when Holtec signed the settlement agreement with the state attorney general in June of 2020, it agreed, agreed to comply with all applicable environmental and human health based standards and regulations of the Commonwealth. Cer certain state laws clearly prohibit such a discharge, above all, the Ocean Sanctuary Act, the OSA, which defines pollutants broadly and includes radioactive contaminants. Discharge is clearly illegal, but neither the NRC nor Holtec acknowledges the relevance of the settlement agreement and Holtec's current water discharge permits concurrently issued by federal and state environmental protection agencies do not authorize this discharge. But these agencies concern themselves solely with chemicals deferring to the NRC for radionuclides. And in March, Holtec applied to both agencies for modified permits that would allow what, what, what is illegal, that would allow discharge of its waste. The water can't be treated to remove most, they can be treated, but not able to remove all pollutants and filtering cannot remove tritium at all. Um, tritium is very dangerous, especially harmful when uptaken by marine creatures and then organically bound. And we have no idea what the interactions between radionuclides and chemicals is because it really hasn't been sufficiently studied. Uh, so Holtec, the NRC, and the EPA, and our state agencies all frame this discussion in terms of how many pollutants can be detected and try to- And I need to ask you to wrap up so we can keep on okay. time. Okay. And they try to persuade us that if barely detectable, the pollutants are no problem based on science from 50 years ago. So uh, the issue has to be framed in terms of legality. The myth of NRC preemption gets poised even by those who mean well, but do not understand state laws or the contractual nature of the settlement agreement, but law is only good as, it, as, in, as its enforcement. And our new governor, Maura Healy, uh, is the one who presided over the settlement agreement. She has made uh, promising statements, but we are holding our breath. Uh, we're cautiously ho hopeful, but hope is not a plan, so we keep fighting because as Mary Lampert says, better active than radioactive. Thank you. Thank you, Henrietta. I have two announcements before we turn to, to Oleg's talk. Um, first of all, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll be collecting them and, and moving from there. Second, I need to apologize. Uh, I cut Deb Katz off a little bit early. Uh, so after we uh, hear from Oleg, uh, we will give Deb a few more minutes to kind of finish out her, her presentation. I'm embarrassed and, and apologize to Deb. Oleg? Sean? Спасибо, Joseph. Прошу Шона включить мою мою видео, мою презентацию.
Добрый день, Америка. Добрый вечер, Россия. Уважаемые участники конференции. Экологическая безопасность будет эксплуатации атомных электростанций. Это глобальная проблема. Сейчас очевидный тезис подвергает политике. Политики пытаются разделить нашу планету и гражданское общество на сферу своего влияния. Я хочу выразить признательность американским партнерам за поддержку и проведение нашей транснациональной конференции. Последние 20 лет я с коллегами из России, Норвегии, Украины и других стран изучал мировой опыт работы атомных электростанций. И Сегодня я вызова, на котором гражданскому обществу. Делаю это в эксплуатации Ленинградской Вызов безопасности. Отсутствие комплекса безопасности в эксплуатации атомных электростанций. Ленинградская АЭС с 8 гражданских и разных этапах жизненного цикла, в том числе в ресурса. Реакторы выводятся из эксплуатации. Размещено временное хранилище отработавшего ядерного топлива шестером Ленинградской экологическая безопасность воздействие на окружающих пример. Недавно в прошли общественные На них обсуждали материалы оценки воздействия и восьмого блока, который хотят построить. Сейчас главным образом работники предприятий. Учитывая, скоро будут вводить чернобыльских городской АЭС. А ведь они государственные дал добро на начало строительства. Почему я так думаю? Ученые российской это эксперт. Емкость этого района давали была закрыта независимая то есть был ликвидирован а не сама Объектов 
тем, что было 30 лет назад, когда происходила экспертиза Академии наук. Емкость региона. Перед вами результаты многолетнего мониторинга. Чем мы исследовали состояние случин ядерного проводил Санкт-Петербург. Следующему я его назвал двойные безопасности. тысяч тонн планирует в Уральский. Переработки ядерного топлива маяк. Но это было В результате эти были загрязнены гигантские территории. России подписали. обращение с радиоактивными отходами гражданских организаций атомных регионов России. Такая коллекция может выработать и решение для вывода из эксплуатации. Самый серьезный выход безопасности. Риск разрушения АЭС генералов о возможных боевых столкновениях между и Россией. No sound. Это обозначена граница военной конфронтации между и Россией. Вот это работало 32 реактора. Ситуация на Запорожской армии в Украине показывает, что у военных и политиков и станций в качестве военной цели. Содержится раз больше, чем в атомной Это не имеет значения, в какую 
сразу произойдет разрушение атомных станций, отработанных миллионов человек коснется и многих будущих поколений. 
develop and approve a decommissioning and dismantlement plan before, before removal of major components. Responsible decommissioning could extend cleanup eight to 10 years, but it limits worker exposure, it contains costs, and it limits the burden of waste to other communities. In conclusion, I want to lay out the following. NRC must retake its authority and propose a new set of regulations for decommissioning and fuel storage. It remains in violation of the appellate court decision and must engage in a rulemaking to finally write the rules on decommissioning. To restore accountability and to be in compliance with the Atomic Energy Act and the National Environmental Policy Act, NRC must establish a set of standards that apply specifically to post-operational activities. NRC uses a series of license amendments for operating reactors to approve decommissioning activities. This is unacceptable. These standards should provide the licensing decisions and a meaningful opportunity for a hearing with the potential for redress in the courts make clear distinctions between decommissioning activities and post-operational fuel storage, set clear, specific, and comprehensive standards for post-operational activities that ensure that decommissioning is carried out with sufficient oversight. I want to end with Judge Ponzer's last statement. It would seem no more than simple fairness as a matter of policy, if not of strict law, to give local people the opportunity to be heard when something of this magnitude occurs in their community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And uh, thank you for your flexibility here and coming back as well as you did. I, I, again, I apologize. So let me then turn the... Um, Mike, uh, over to uh, Linda Pence Gunter and uh, Nat um, Trumbull, uh, who will uh, be be asking the questions that uh, quite a number of you have submitted in the Q and A box. I have to say that unfortunately we will not have time to take all of those questions right now, uh, but we'll have other Q and A periods, and as we can, we'll pick them we'll pick them up. Uh, so, um, uh, Linda and Nat, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joe. And, and just to remind participants today that the questions that we're taking uh, are about decommissioning. That's the focus of what we're here to discuss. Um, and specifically, not so much the technical aspects of decommissioning, but the civil engagement aspects of decommissioning, how we as civil society can better engage uh, with our political leaders, our regulators, and the industry to ensure that since decommissioning has to happen, it happens in a safe and secure manner. And, and I do have a question, I think this is directed to Deb, but also maybe Alec, is how, when, how do communities protect themselves uh, when you have a regulator, certainly speaking as Deb spoke from the US perspective, when you have a nuclear regulator who is very much on the same team as the industry uh, and therefore, as she described, will even allow the industry to do something that they haven't even approved yet. And, and how do you confront this? Uh, how do communities who are affected by this confront it in the US, and perhaps Alec, you can answer that question as it regards Russia as well. Thank you. I mean, it's really hard because we, you know, we believe in some ways, or maybe we used to believe that the federal government was there to protect us. And of course, when you realize they're not and that they're there to protect the industry, it's both painful and frightening. I think what happens at this point is that groups need to pressure states to do the work that the NRC won't do, which is not so easy, but there is the potential to try to pressure through the state, the, the NRC to take on some issues. One, I think, is hardening the waste on site so it's protected from acts of malice. And I think also getting the states to take on an analysis of what climate disruption, the effect it will have on, uh, on these sites in for that will hold waste there for decades, if not longer. I mean, in terms of decommissioning, the NRC has officially integrated the rule. 
And the issue is whether someone's going to take up our case, in a sense, can be NRC, we can't do it at this point, and go back to court and say they haven't done their job. The next question is from well, Alec. I, I yeah, think Alec was going to answer this one first. Yeah, Alec, go ahead. Да, коллеги, я полагаю, что атомная отрасль в России ведет себя ровно так же, как и в Соединенных Штатах. Это всемирная корпорация, которая свои интересы продвигает в ущерб гражданам и жителям нашей планеты. Конкретный пример. Семь лет назад в нашем городе пытались начать строительство подземного могильника радиоактивных отходов. И это делалось с нарушением законодательства. Но это было очень удобно и оператору, и регулятор тоже не возражал против этого. И в то же время не было конкретных механизмов, которые могли бы остановить этот процесс. Но нам удалось э, мотивировать э, законодателей Ленинградской области, на территории которого на находится этот могильник, а также Санкт-Петербурга, который находится в 35 километрах от могильника, что это представляет опасность для всех. И Впервые в истории был, было принято решение законодателей двух регионов, которые могли быть жертвами этого процесса. Они заявили, что мы против этого строительства. Это было не предусмотрено законодательством такая реакция, но тем не менее этот проект был остановлен. Поэтому вот мне кажется, нам нужно искать совместные шаги не только на той территории, где мы находимся, но и с коллегами и партнерами из других стран и из других регионов России. Поэтому вот в создании новой формы противодействия, мне кажется, это реальный шаг для достижения позитивного результата. And Linda, we'll, we'll go next to a Russian attendee's question, and I'll read that in Russian uh, and be waiting for the translation. Вопрос к американским коллегам. Проектный срок эксплуатации американских реакторов 40 лет. В настоящее время из 92 энергоблоков была половина эксплуатируется свыше проектного срока. Они имеют лицензии на эксплуатацию 60 лет, а 6 блоков получили повторное продление до 80 лет. Пожалуйста, сообщите, должны ли проводиться общественные слушания для продления сроков эксплуатации реактора. We might start with, with Deb. So um, there are some hearings on this, but I mean, again, the system is rigged and it's set up so that people, the ability for the people to actually participate has been eviscerated. I mean, when the Atomic Energy Act came into existence, it was set up because nuclear was so dangerous and knew that there had to be public participation and state participation. And since the beginning, the NRC has worked assiduously to undermine that, that participation and they've done a great job at it. So it is very hard for people to participate in matters that vitally affect them. And yes, all those licensees are getting extended rather than actually doing the work to see how embrittled the reactors are from 40 years of bombardment. Thank you. Henrietta, would you like to add something to that reply? Well, I can only affirm that everything Deb said is what we've experienced. And every time the MR NRC has come to Plymouth, for example, for hearings, it's been an absolute charade. The 
the officials sit up on a dais and they they spend the first hour making a presentation that will stultify you. Uh, then they ask for questions. And even if you have managed to mobilize 100 or 200 people, um, their questions will always be met with a stonewall of non-response. Non uh, They're clearly checking off a box because it says they have to have a hearing, but nothing is ever, never, nothing gets through. Uh, because clearly they don't want it to. It's clear. Go ahead, Deb. I, I just want to say one thing. How can you have a hearing when you have no information? I mean, the whole system is set up now so that there is no information that the public has, which would allow them to even question what the agency is doing or what the corporation is doing. Without information, basically democracy is dead. And yes. that's what they've accomplished. Henrietta, I think we have time for just one more question. We try oh, okay, to go ahead. I, I was just going to say, yes, uh, obfuscation, Lack of, of transparency is a strategy, make no mistake. So I think we'll just quickly jump then to a question which came actually to you, Hello. Alan, but in Good English, evening, yeah. Could if we don't have, me? yeah. Uh, what okay. ровно то же so самое quick, that was a происходит и в России. Поэтому uh, не удивляйтесь, uh, я со своим коллегой, mm -hmm. который сегодня будет выступать, Андрей Талевлин, Несколько лет назад инициировали судебный процесс с требованием провести общественные слушания по э, проекту продления ресурса атомной станции. Э, и это э, требование было в норме. Законодательная норма требовала проведения таких слушаний. Э, этот суд состоялся в Москве там, где расположена российская госкорпорация. И суд нам отказал в рассмотрении, даже не было рассмотрения нашего требования. После этого эта норма закона исчезла. То есть сейчас уже нет необходимости проводить общественные слушания при продлении эксплуатации атомных станций. Этот процесс продолжается, так что все так же, как у вас. So I'm going to interject myself here with, with apologies, uh, but we have two more panels to come up and a lot more information to be shared. Uh, so uh, I think at this point, we need to move to a five minute break, no longer. Uh, so by my clock, that means we'll be starting again at 11.15. Uh, and uh, please, everybody, show up on time. It was a very, very rich panel. Uh, but now take a quick break. Жанна, вы слышите меня? So, yeah, I,
Okay, um, we can all come back into session here. Um, I'd like to see my speakers here back online. Uh, and as you could have seen, we're about to begin uh, the second panel. Uh, our speakers are Paul Gunter, Sarah Abramson and Nikolai Kuzmin. Uh, the focus of this panel is environmental hazards and opportunities provided in decommissioning. Uh, brief introductions, so I want to save time here. Uh, Paul is the Director of Reactor Oversight at Beyond Nuclear. He is the lead spokesperson on nuclear reactor hazards and security concerns and serves on the regulatory watchdog over the, the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission and nuclear power industry. Sarah, who we've introduced before, is the Executive Director of C10 Research and Education Foundation, which focuses on the public and environmental safety of the areas surrounding the Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant in New Hampshire, about which we've heard some already. And then we're very privileged to have Nikolai Kuzman, who is a member of the Standing Committee on the Environmental Safety and Nature Management of the Leningrad Oblast Legislative Assembly. And Oblast is sort of the equivalent of a state here in the United States. He is an academician of the uh, International Academy of Sciences and Ecology, uh, Human Security and Nature. And to say that for many of us here in the United States, it's a privilege to be hearing uh, him as well as our other two uh, Russian uh, speakers and experts. So thank you very much. And Paul, the floor is yours. Okay. Let's see. You can hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing the PowerPoint. I'm going to take a minute to get it. I'm sorry. It didn't come up right away. Um, um, can can someone else share the, uh, can our technicians share the uh, PowerPoint? Yeah, we're still trying to pull up the PowerPoint. So Where is it? Where is it? it's not here. Isn't it? Sean, can you bring it up? Hey, wait, I, uh, let's see. Okay, sorry. There we go. I apologize. Yes. Can you see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Decommissioning is more than just dismantlement and site remediation of permanently closed nuclear reactors. In fact, decommission is an essential link to the safety and reliability of the extended operations of the remaining operating fleet. One federal laboratory here in the United States wrote that the industry should be required at decommissioning to conduct the equivalent of a medical autopsy. This would include the strategic harvesting of aged samples of metals, weld material, reactor internals, electrical cables, and concrete for laboratory analysis needed to address identified knowledge gaps in the safety review of operating license renewals. Beyond Nuclear has obtained documents 
that show the U U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NRC, and one of the nation's prestigious federal laboratories have identified that decommissioning has a critical but unfulfilled role to provide the reasonable assurance needed to approve the safety and environmental qualification for extending reactor operating license as required under the US Atomic Energy Act and NRC regulation. The US nuclear industry and the NRC have already extended operating licenses for the majority of the nation's nuclear fleet from 40 to 60 years. They are now approving operations out to 80 years. A beyond nuclear investigation reveals a regulatory controversy where the industry's focus on managing its costs while extending power operations is suppressing and disposing of scientific data needed to address critical safety related and technological knowledge gaps in approving license renewal applications. Here are two photos of the top of the Ohio Davis Bessey reactor pressure vessel head. The photo on the left was taken in April 2000 at the end of a scheduled refueling outage before the reactor was allowed to return to power operations. It is an obvious example of the unmanaged deterioration of reactor safety margins. Still more dangerous aspects of age-related degradation are not readily visible or understood, including the changes caused by intense neutron radiation with the loss of ductility in metals. In this case, the deterioration started with stress corrosion cracking caused by neutron radiation attacking the stainless steel sleeves for driving the control rods through the reactor pressure vessel head into the reactor core. The high pressure steam in the vessel leaked corrosive reactor coolant through the creaks that condensed and pooled into concentrated boric acid collecting on the top of the vessel head. Over time, the photo on the right, the acid corroded a cavity through six and three quarter inches of carbon steel to within three sixteenths of an inch from bursting into a severe nuclear accident. A host of degradation mechanisms are similarly attacking reactor safety margins in the harsh operational environment of nuclear plants. These age-related attacks affect the integrity of reactor systems, structures, and components, including irreplaceable components like reactor pressure vessels and reinforced concrete containment structures. There are hundreds of miles of aging electrical cable in each reactor unit. Understanding the causes and control of these degradation mechanisms is essential to maintain functionality and safety margins into these projected license extensions. On September 4th, 2015, the NRC Office of Reactor Research contracted with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory to address known technological gaps in the license renewal review process to address potential safety consequences for the extension period. The research is needed to provide, quote, the reasonable assurance, unquote, that there is enough safety margin available in the extended 60 to 80 year operating period. The National Laboratory published its findings on December 7, 2017 in a technical report 
posted to three public websites, including the National Laboratory, the US Department of Energy's Office of Scientific and Technical Information, and the International Atomic Energy Agency's International Nuclear Information System. The scientific report's findings reported that closing these knowledge gaps will require strategic autopsies during decommissioning. Here is one finding, quote, these shutdown plants provide an opportunity to extract materials that have real world aging and provide an avenue for benchmarking laboratory scale studies on materials aging. The resulting insights into material aging mechanisms and precise margins to failure will be essential to provide reasonable assurance that the materials and components will continue to perform their safety function throughout the plant licensing period, end quote. On September 26, 2018, 10 months after the report's posting, I attended a public meeting at the NRC headquarters on license renewal with questions about the critical connection between decommissioning and license renewal. The NRC staff responded. They could not answer other than the publication of the report as vetted and posted to these three government scientific websites was a mistake. Immediately after that meeting, the NRC wiped the December 2017 technical report from all three government websites. A Beyond Nuclear Freedom of Information Act request reveals that staff with the NRC Division of Materials for License Renewal had previously reviewed the technical report and anonymous, anonymously commented, quote, I get what the authors are trying to state. However, if I was an intervener, I would use this document to shut down subsequent license renewal applications." End quote. Another quote. Big picture, I think the entire report needs to be scrubbed for text that points to gaps. And if issued, we need to, we need to have a stronger basis for why we will grant renewed licenses before the harvesting and testing is completed, end quote. NRC staff subsequently revised and reframed the 2017 report after it had been scrubbed of all references to the laboratory's recognition of technical knowledge gaps in the NRC relicensing review process. NRC further deleted laboratory references to require autopsies as essential to establishing reasonable assurance for license renewal approval. On March 31st, 2019, the NRC scrubbed version revision of the technical report was republished and posted only to the NRC website. To date, the revision has never been reposted to the other scientific websites. According to the NRC transcript on, oops. According to the NRC trans, let's see, I'm sorry. Well, just to say, you've got about another minute or so. Okay. According to the NRC transcripts on October 6, 2022, a meeting between NRC staff and the NRC's agency uh, advisory committee on reactor safeguards, uh, we learned that the NRC is having a very difficult challenge in finding willing partners in the industry to do the strategic harvesting and for laboratory analysis to benefit uh, the safety of these license renewals. As disturbing, what the staff reported in this transcript is that the very first thing 
that utilities in many cases are doing at the beginning of decommissioning is to delete the operational data from the previous uh, operating period for decades from um, its records. And this is precisely the information that the NRC is now seeking in order to uh, answer these questions about the technological gaps. Scientific integrity is essential and it is deliverable through a meaningful merger of decommissioning and the license renewal process. Otherwise, burying the industry's bodies without autopsies, the NRC cannot demonstrate that they meet the reasonable assurance legal standard for extending reactor operations as required under the U.S. Atomic Energy Act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's a very, very helpful and, of course, disturbing uh, information here. Uh, so I think we're next up with Sarah. The floor is yours. So first, thank you to my colleagues for including me and in organizing and being a part of this. Uh, my name is Sarah Abramson. I am the executive director of C10 Research and Education Foundation. Uh, and the story that I'll tell today, uh, C10 is the protagonist and the other characters are the local nuclear power plant in Seabrook, New Hampshire, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, elected officials, the media, the public and various experts. Uh, the story has been described to be similar to David and Goliath, and this metaphor highlights how the Davids of the world, the public and us advocates, can feel like taking on the big corporation or the regulator is a futile task. Um, and the Goliaths of the world, in this case, the company and the NRC might feel like they can operate unabated uh, without having to worry about what we think about what they're doing. So uh, what can we do? We can pick up a slingshot and we can start chucking stones. And how do we make sure that those stones hit their target? Uh, I'll borrow this formula, which describes what we lovingly call the three-legged stool. Uh, so you'll see advocacy groups plus engagement with legislator, legislators and media and also engaging subject matter experts can yield results. So about C10, we were formed in 1991, essentially when the Seabrook nuclear power plant came online. And we have a mission that focused on, focuses on three pillars. We operate a real-time radiological monitoring network. So a couple presenters in the past have talked about um, the technology that's out there to do sophisticated minute-by-minute real-time monitoring that can be automatically reported to a database or alert health officials if there's a spike. We do that exact type of uh, radiation monitoring in our communities. Uh, we're also a watchdog and a safety group. We look out for things like the decommissioning rule changes that were proposed that strip away public involvement opportunities. Um, we also serve as a trusted information, source of information for those legislators, for members of the media and for the public. Um, and we do our best to hold the corporations and the regulators responsible and accountable for what they are required to do, which is maintain uh, public safety and environmental safety. So the issue in this story was uh, seeking stronger oversight of the uh, Seabrook nuclear power plants degrading concrete. Um, among This is after a spattering of, of historical issues at the plant, fire safety violations, emergency planning shortcomings, incidental killing of nearly 100 baby seals, uh, but none were so serious and dire as this concrete issue caused by alkali silica reaction, and we refer to it as a concrete cancer. And it's happening at this plant because of the types of aggregates that were used in the concrete when the plant was built over 30 years ago. Uh, there is no known cure, just a promise that it will get worse with time. And this is the only US plant known to have this problem right now. And only two other nuclear plants in the world can make the same claim. Um, and they are no longer in operation. So in 2014, the owners of the Seabrook nuclear power plant rushed to renew their operating license. 
14 years ahead of their 2030 license expiration date. And this was before this ASR issue had been fully evaluated. In 2017, the NRC approved the plant's license renewal request, which included scant and pretty relaxed requirements related to this concrete issue. So C10's concern. These requirements did not appear to be scientifically based. And if they were, like some of our panelists have said before, we didn't have access to all of the documentations and the justifications from the plant's owners on how they came up with this plan. Um, and the requirements um, you know, weren't very shocking. We just covered how the NRC and nuclear industry often tells us that we, the public, are unknowledgeable and therefore unqualified to weigh in on nuclear safety matters. But in this case, uh, they made these decisions in relative isolation, or should I say in most cases, they make these decisions in a vacuum, and they're setting rules for this scientific problem, this ASR concrete cancer, for which they themselves have absolutely no expertise. So this is where C10 embraced the dated role, and our first slingshot stone that we fired was bringing a formal legal challenge to the NRC's approval of that license renewal. So also enter elected leaders, the media, public support, and subject matter experts. Um, and I also want to note that because of the Administrative Policy Act, uh, we have to, we the public, have to convince the agency to let us sue them, to let us legally intervene on a, on a decision that they've made. So we had to prove to the NRC, uh, appeal to a particular panel, that they meaning the, the, the folks in the NRC who approved the license renewal, uh, weren't doing a good enough job. So that's a pretty high bar to convince an agency to let you sue them. And that's a, a big problem from the public engagement perspective. So how do you get uh, the, the um, elected officials aligned with you? Uh, be substantive and be honest. And if you're making a claim, you know, do your best to make sure that it's fact-based because if they repeat that claim, you know, later when they're advocating for you and it's not true, uh, you know, the corporations and the lobbyists will, will kind of tear them apart. Um, so we've uh, been sure to make sure that we were evidence-based in our arguments. Um, and no matter what the nuclear industry might say about feelings being meaningless in decision-making, uh, fear and uh, discomfort you know, can drive quality of life and also economic factors. Uh, we talk about Pilgrim. If people think that the fish and the seafood products there are irradiated, that's a feeling, but it might result in a pretty big economic impact to their community. And the same could be said for the seafood community we're similarly um, coastally aligned. Uh, and we don't ignore a politician or a media outlet just because they're pro-nuclear, either stated that themselves or we think that's the case because they can be pro safety at the same time and very well may support your cause, especially if you bring to it um, all of the things that I've mentioned. So we try to spend more time with our legislators talking about the things that we agree on and less time on the things that we don't. So reaching the media and the public. So getting media attention, ring the bell and ringing it loudly. When we wanted to interrupt that license renewal, or at least interrupt the very relaxed standards related to the concrete issue, we stayed laser focused on the concrete issue. This was the thing, this was the, the bullet, you know, that could actually pierce that corporate veil. And so we stayed uh, really focused on it and tried to stay out of the uh, anti-nuclear or a political fray. We set the urgency that this legal case would be setting precedent a victory here could mean better handling of ASR if, when, it's discovered at other nuclear plants. Plus, we had nothing to lose. If we lost, then we're stuck with the same bad rules that were already uh, being played in the game um, by the nuclear power plant. And the last leg of the stool, the secret sauce, as we call it, is subject matter experts. They bring legitimacy to your argument and in a legal case, you know, bring compelling evidence. Uh, they're the game changers. We had an attorney, Diane Curran, that specializes in um, nuclear regulatory commission cases. She offered to work with us. Um, 
luckily, the media attention was also heightened when a subject matter expert, Dr. Victor Salma, contacted us. And that was in part because we had already been doing a, a, the best we could to get media involved and get the word out. So he found us because we were ringing that bell so loudly already. Um, we also had a uh, former Union of Concerned Scientists nuclear expert, David Lockbaum. Um, and we got a lot of you know, gratis free help from these people, um, or at least reduced costs. The public engagement knob had to be turned way up. And the onus was unfortunately on us to do that. Mostly volunteers taking time out of their day to read hundreds of pages about concrete. And uh, we had to try to raise money to fund this legal case. They're not cheap. So poor communities are even more unable to kind of reach that super high bar that I talked about. Um, and also uh, to make sure that we could garner the support from the elected officials and the public at large. So what were the results? After a couple of years of fighting this battle, we, uh, it culminated in a ruling in favor of a lot of our asks. It didn't go as far as we asked, but it still went way further than the original license renewal requirements. Uh, instead of checking on the concrete cracks and how bad they're getting every 10 years, that's what was in the license renewal, they now have to check them every six months. That is a huge difference. Um, if the cracking moves faster than we thought, if now that we're checking it, we find that the trend is really scary and fast, then we have to pump the brakes and the NRC can come back and give an even stricter rule. Maybe you have to check it every three months. Um, the plant also has to watch for impacts to the rebar. Uh, they have to use petrographic analysis, which is much more advanced than the old look-see approach that they were trying to get by with before. Um, and so we were happy with with the things that we were able to, to take away from this legal victory. So the secret sauce, the three-legged stool, as I said, it's um, the formula that you may have already recognized in other stories that you've heard today. And it's really simple and I'm just laying it out uh, in this with plus sign, equal sign format. Um, and sometimes as advocates, we can be so immersed in the details that we forget that not everybody knows what we know or we can have a blind spot uh, because we've become pseudo experts in certain scientific aspects that we might not you know, be professional in. Um, and so we might neglect to reach out to those subject matter experts, but there's a very vibrant and accessible scientific community that is willing and able and eager and sometimes for free will help you make these, uh, make these cases. Just another minute here, Sarah. Thanks, this is uh, my last slide, I think. Um, so we also noticed that you shouldn't count out the regulators. Um, we, you'll see some quotes here. We've been granted access or we've you know, kind of earned or just asked, kicked down the door to get access to uh, resident inspectors, to certain boards, licensing boards and uh, technical experts in the NRC. And you know, we email, we call, we try to get them on the phone with us. And they've even told us that sometimes a Zoom or a phone call is a better avenue to get information than a written request or asking them on the spot at a formal hearing or a formal meeting because there's so much legality and you know other arms of tentacles of the NRC or the industry will try to shut down that candor from people who are willing to speak the truth. Um, so try to nurture those relationships and find the people that will give you their cell phone and talk to them um, because they'll tell you way more than you think they might tell you. Um, are all of the NRC reps that you reach out to going to give you this level of attention? No, uh, but it's, it's worth trying because you can get a few. Um, and we take away what we can from the relationship. Sometimes you'll be talking to them and you'll hear something that you know is sort of being opaque on purpose and you just push, but if, you know, if they're not going to break, they might even tell you, I can't tell you more about that. Um, then you just move on to something and try to probe and see what they will tell you. Um, and so what we take away is um, that combining these different strategies into one cohesive um, combined strategy is a good footprint for trying to make your, your effort, your public engagement um, a more effective. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That's a really good model for a lot of communities and uh, 
organizations and activists to be following. So thank you very much. It's now my now my privilege to uh, turn the uh, mic and the screen uh, over to uh, Nikolai Kuzmin. Thank you very much for joining us, Nikolai. Уважаемые участники, я прошу Шона включить видеозапись Николая. Правда, нужно учесть, что звук моей, моей презентации был не очень хороший. Если это повторится с, с, с презентацией Николая, то я хочу информировать российских участников, что я перешлю всем наши выступления с хорошим качеством. Так что не беспокойтесь. Я уже либо готов выступить в любом эфире. Так что, пожалуйста, Шон, включите видео. Уважаемые участники конференции, приветствую вас из атомного города Сосновый Бор, где находится один из крупнейших в мире ядерных комплексов. Здесь уже 50 лет работает крупнейшая в России Ленинградская атомная электростанция с реакторами чернобыльского типа РБМК-1000. Первые два реактора выработали проектный ресурс, и окончательно остановлены. Их планируют выводить из эксплуатации в ближайшие 35 лет. Вместо остановленных энергоблоков строятся новые. Я живу здесь уже более 45 лет. Сначала участвовал в строительстве Ленинградской атомной станции, а с 2007 года по настоящее время депутат Законодательного собрания Ленинградской области. Вначале несколько фактов о том, как принимаются решения по атомным проектам. Как известно, атомная энергетика возникла в США и в России, в Советском Союзе, как побочный продукт создания ядерного оружия. Поэтому и механизмы принятия решений по проектам российских атомных станций принимаются по такой же схеме, как и для атомного оружия. Политические решения принимаются в Москве. Эти решения обосновываются экономическими причинами, национальными интересами и финансируются из федерального бюджета. После этого идет согласование с специальной комиссией правительства Ленинградской области. При этом учитываются главным образом только экономические критерии, то есть сколько денег будет поступать в бюджет, сколько будет создано рабочих мест, какие объемы инвестиций. Важная деталь, что 5-миллионный город Санкт-Петербург в 35 километрах от Ленинградской атомной станции и потребляющий более 60% атомного электричества, не участвует в принятии решения. В таком же положении находится и 2 миллиона жителей Ленинградской области, то есть социально-экологические потребности 7 миллионов жителей региона Финского залива не принимаются во внимание. В результате такой схемы принятия решений за последние 20 лет в регионе произошли существенные изменения. Утраченное промышленное рыболовство, закрытые 4 перерабат... рыбоперерабатывающих завода, разрушен традиционный уклад жизни коренных жителей побережья Финского залива. Я считаю, что пришло время пересмотра механизмов принятия решений по атомным и логистическим проектам. Необходим учет региональных социально-экологических потребностей. Нужны оценки состояния природных экосистем в районе атомных и промышленных объектов в регионе Финского залива. Для этого нужно, во-первых, 
создать межрегиональную экологическую лабораторию под патронажем правительства Ленинградской области, Санкт-Петербурга и под, контр... под контролем наблюдательного совета. В состав совета должны входить законодатели Ленинградской области, Санкт-Петербурга, эксперты и заинтересованная общественность. Лаборатория должна делать оценки состояния природных экосистем в регионе Финского залива. Нельзя допускать разрушения природных механизмов воспроизводства здоровой среды обитания. Необходимо, чтобы лаборатория давала публичные рекомендации лицам, принимающим решение о допустимости реализации атомных проектов. Финансирование лаборатории должно осуществляться из специального фонда за счет отчислений предприятий Ленинградской области и Санкт-Петербурга. Во-вторых, необходимо провести стратегическую экологическую оценку региона Финского залива. И на основе этой оценки необходимо провести зонирование региона Финского залива с определением зон потенциально промышленного развития, зоны сельскохозяйственной деятельности, рекреации и зона особой охраны природы и биоразнообразия. В-третьих, разработать региональные законы Ленинградской области и Санкт-Петербурга по участию региональных заинтересованных сторон в процессе принятия решения по атомным объектам. Это первоочередная задача в настоящее время. Моя попытка продвижения регионального закона, усиливающего роль законодателей и общественности, пока не была успешной. Региональные законодатели посчитали, что не обладают компетенцией в столь сложной сфере, как атомная энергетика. И все было отдано на Росатому на решение вопросов. Считаю что должны быть публичные дебаты в региональных законодательных собраниях по атомным проектам, в том числе по проектам вывода из эксплуатации атомных энергоблоков. Операторы атомных объектов должны на доступном языке доказывать приемлемость экологических последствий таких проектов. В этом случае региональное сообщество будет иметь возможность осознанного участия в принимаемых решениях. Спасибо. Thank you, thank you, Nikolai, for very helpful insights into both what the challenges you face are and ways to ways to um, address them. Uh, we now have uh, time to uh, jump into our uh, Q&A uh, period. Uh, a reminder, if you uh, haven't already submitted a question, uh, you can do so in the Q&A uh, icon down at the bottom of your screen. And so I'll uh, give the floor over to uh, Linda and to Nat. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. So um, we've had quite a few questions that came in even before these presentations. And uh, I imagine that we can invite also some of our previous speakers if need be to jump in. But um, I just want to go uh, with one, first of all, from Marta Daniels. And, and this actually is probably for you, Paul, but it would be interesting to know what the situation is in Russia as well about the on-site storage of the waste once uh, reactors are undergoing decommissioning, even obviously before they undergo decommissioning, but certainly once they are and the waste is stored on site. And she wants to know uh, what progress there is in either country to develop an alternative to continuing to store the waste on site. Um, and if you have to move it off the site, whether there's any realistic safe transportation mechanism for moving it somewhere else. And of course, this raises the question of whether or not it should be moved in the first place. But in the framework of decommissioning a nuclear power plant, um, we'll go perhaps with Paul first, and then maybe Nikolai and Alec want to answer as well, uh, what, what your feelings are about the waste safeguarding aspect of decommissioning. And I apologize that this is rather a techni more technically focused question. But again, I think maybe Deb might want to jump in as well and talk about the public engagement on how you can at least 
ensure that if it is going to stay on site, it's in the safest condition possible. Right. Well, obviously, we could do a whole webinar on this one question. But to suffice to say that, uh, again, the, the, um, the, the review of this issue, this uh, conundrum of what to do with the nuclear waste that's been generated, it's, it's, a back, it's a backwards process right now because we have generated in this country roughly 85 to 90,000 metric tons of high level radioactive waste before we figured out what to do with it, how to transport it, um, and how to, you know, how it's going to be maintained um, without a single watt of benefit to the future generations that take all the liability and none of the benefit. And so um, it's been, uh, you know, right now it's not really safe anywhere. Uh, in in the broad picture, uh, the security is uh, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to a 9/11 attack, for example, where aircraft can be used. We're vulnerable to um, uh, domestic terrorism, uh, for that matter. Uh, so, uh, but there are no. Um, final repositories available, um, and it's not safe where it is. Um, the dry, predominantly it's wet storage right now. So um, it's stored in uh, very large swimming pools. Uh, some of these pools are on top of the reactor building. So they're elevated six to 10 stories up into the air. Uh, these are the GE Mark Ones, um, and in other cases, it's been moved into these dry casks, which are parked on a like a parking lot, it, like a bowling alley, where they're closely congregated. Uh, so you know that's the short answer. It's not safe where it is. We have no plan um, that has been ethically accepted by our countries. Um, but they're still making more. And I don't know um, whether Nikolai or Alec want to address the waste he commissioned nuclear power plants in uh, Russia or perhaps Бассейн выдержки вот этих отработанного ядерного топлива, кассет не разделанных из реактора не вынимаются, одиннадцатиметровые опускаются в бассейн, и там они находились очень долгое время. Когда мы приступили к реконструкции атомной станции, накопили около тридцати комплектов отработанного ядерного топлива, мы построили специальный автоматизированный роботизированный комплекс, где Эти кассеты разрубаются, верхняя и нижняя часть, где нет радиоактивных элементов, отрубается, но утилизация идет. А кассета рубится пополам вместе с урановым отработанным топливом, загружаются бетонно-металлические контейнеры, специальные контейнеры для вот сухого хранения, о чем говорил коллега. Это пятиметровой высоты бочка, два с половиной метром диаметром, С нее откачиваются все газы, когда погружается разрубленная кассета, вот это отработанное ядерное топливо, и заполняется инертным газом и запаивается. Эти бетонно-металлические контейнеры провели испытания, выдерживают, у, там, если самолет падает на это дело, значит, они остаются герметичными. Срок дальнейшей переработки вот этого отработанного ядерного топлива у нас это должно отправляться туда в центр в Сибири, в Красноярске, и там ждет своего часа в течение 50 лет. Говорят о том, что будут придуманы технологии для дальнейшего использования вот этого недогоревшего является высоко токсичным как бы отработанным материалом на существующих реакторах. 
И вот Олег Викторович дополнит, потому что он занимался и в лаборатории, и в этих. Я только как строитель, как эксплуат... ну, там частично с эксплуатацией работал, потом вот депутатом. Он непосредственно был в лаборатории и дополнит вот эту тему. Уважаемые коллеги, эти металлобетонные контейнеры сейчас отправляются в Сибирь. Я говорил в своей презентации... И там они стоят на специаль... в специальном здании, и на сегодняшний день отсутствуют технологии по дальнейшему захоронению или долговременному хранению. Известно, что гарантия дана на 70 лет. При этом, по оценкам экспертов, в результате естественного распада плутония внутри этих кассет образуется гелий, газ. Через 70 лет внутри тепловыделяющей сборки повышается давление, и в результате может произойти разрушение этого тепловыделяющей сборки, и радиоактивность пойдет в окружающую среду. Какое решение? Ну, наверное, такое же решение, как уже моя коллега говорила. Это будет... Матрешка, русская матрешка, этот э, контейнер может размещен быть в другом контейнере. Но э, на сегодняшний день 150 тысяч человек э, возражают против того, чтобы из Европы все отработавшее ядерное топливо перевозилось с берега Балтийского моря на берег крупнейшей реки Евразии Енисей. То есть это поведение примерно одинаковое у атомной отрасли. Решение отсутствует. Единственная страна, которая сейчас заканчивает строительство подземного могильника, отработавшего ядерного топлива, это Финляндия. Но этот проект тоже подвергается критике экспертами и финскими, и шведскими. Поэтому это не нигде проблема в мире. Спасибо. Thanks so much. Um, Joe, I'd love to just get one more question in if there's time. I know we're running uh, running late a little bit. And, and this comes from Irin, and it's actually uh, kindly, it was kindly sent in Russian and English, um, so I'll read it in English. And just, uh, you know, to slightly paraphrase it, um, Irin is asking about the differences that we have to confront in the US where the nuclear corporations are commercial and in Russia, where it's a state entity, the industry is a state entity. And how, what's the interaction, how is the interaction different between civil society in the US versus civil society in Russia uh, in, in the different states confronting these nuclear issues given that it's a commercial entity in one country and a state government entity in the other. And I'm open to any of the panelists who want to address this, but you can figure out who would like to go first. I'll just quickly start by saying, really, there's not much difference if the, if the commercial industry has captured the regulator. It's still, you know, um, uh, where the, the technology and the, the all, it's like we have our own set of nuclear oligarchs here in the United States that have captured the regulatory process. And as demonstrated, even in Congress, they have, you know, they fund both sides of the aisle, both Democrat and Republican. So whether or not there's two cents worth of difference between Russia and the United States is, you know, I think not, not very much. And uh, Nikolai. В России те организации, которые активно работали в ядерной безопасности по выводу из эксплуатации, сегодня получили статус иностранных агентов. Это означает ограничение работы с государственными органами. Это первый момент. Второй момент насчет... Коррупции, наверное, Россия и Америка мало чем отличается, но в России придумали еще один механизм. Он называется 
государственные, негосударственные организации или аббревиатура ГОНГО, когда чиновники создают специальные организации, куда входят уполномоченные им люди, и они от имени общественности делают заключение о безопасности. Вот так было сделано заключение для Ленинградской атомной станции, первого и второго энергоблока. Но спустя несколько времени руководитель этой организации был арестован Федеральной службы безопасности спустя несколько лет и ну, исчез из этой организации. Поэтому я повторяю, что атомная отрасль России и Америки – это два брата, которые очень любят друг друга и которые всегда поддержат в тяжелую минуту. Вот в то же Такой... время нам нужно тоже объединяться, чтобы быть достойными оппонентами. Спасибо. Можно да. еще? Уважаемые коллеги, я хочу дополнить, но нельзя так сильно драматизировать эту ситуацию, потому что люди, в том числе и государственные, некоторые перешедшие в бизнес, но имеющие государственное Мышление. отношение, они работают над новыми технологиями, о том, что вот сказал предыдущий коллега, когда говорил, что нужны новые технологии для того, чтобы переработать вот то накопленное, отработанное ядерное топливо в совершенно безопасные элементы. И на сегодняшний день реакторы на быстрых нейтронах, реакторы, которые с, с, ну, готовы удержать плазму, над этим ученые работают и работают над тем, чтобы переработать это токсичное на сегодняшний день, опасное для населения топливо, в безопасное. Поэтому в данном направлении работает давно, но вот я в молодые годы помню, когда Евгений Велихов заявлял о том, что мы за 30 лет на момент пуска в эксплуатацию энергоблоков мы разработаем это, этот механизм. К сожалению, Велихов ошибся лет на 30 точно. Но сегодня работают наши исследовательские институты и в Гатчине, и в Сосновом Бару, и в других регионах которые пытаются привести вот, переработку этого отработанного высокотоксичного ядерного топлива в безопасный вариант. Я думаю, что все-таки человечество способно, э, есть люди, которые э, достигнут этой цели и будет реализовано. Потому что нельзя так вот, да, мы правильно ставим эти вопросы, как общественность от безопасности, и это абсолютно верно. Но все-таки есть люди, которые над этим работают и делают это дело. Поэтому я надеюсь на то, что все-таки проблема это будет в ближайшие 20-15 лет решена. Спасибо. So you're still muted. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, also very interesting to see the the uh, the, the different the different perspectives from uh, across different parts of the planet here. Um, I guess two things to say here. Uh, one is we are going a bit late. Uh, we will take a five minute break here, uh, but I, I want to say that I'm sorry we can't get to all of the questions we had. I uh, wondered whether that would be a problem. Uh, we're saving those questions, uh, those that haven't been answered, and we'll do our best to respond online afterwards. Uh, but also after the next panel, uh, we can go a, a bit longer uh, than planned uh, to try to take some more of the questions online. Uh, so with that, we'll take a break here. Uh, my clock says it's uh, 12.08, so let's reconvene promptly at 12.13. Thank you.
Okay, my uh, my clock says it's uh, time to reconvene. Um, I just want to appreciate that uh, uh, people, the participants, have really hung in here. Uh, a lot of technical discussions, uh, but but uh, clearly this uh, conference is serving a purpose. Uh, I hope everyone is learning as much uh, on it as as I am. Uh, we're now in, about to begin our third panel. Uh, the the panel uh, it will. Um, be focusing on uh, how to open public engagement uh, to the decommissioning process. We've heard little bits of it uh, already, but to go deeper. Uh, our first speaker in this session will be uh, Andre Talavlin, uh, a, a PhD in uh, law, chairman of For Nature, a regional public movement, and an expert uh, of the Decom Atom, a network promoting safe decommissioning of nuclear power plants, uh, and the management of radioactive waste and spent fuel. And our other speaker, once again, uh, will be um, uh, Henrietta Cosentino. Uh, and um, we've, we've had the introduction to the very active around the Plymouth uh, nuclear power plant uh, and working to do what's possible to ensure the safety of the community there in Southeastern Massachusetts. So with that, um, uh, Andre, let me give you the floor. Ron, uh, я прошу запустить uh, презентацию Андрея Талевлина. Uh, спасибо, Джозеф, за предоставленное слово. Uh, Пожалуйста, Андрей, включите Андрей, презентацию. Uh, сейчас презентация будет твоя видео. Добрый день, уважаемые участники конференции. Меня зовут Андрей Талевлин, я из Челябинска. И хочу представить вашему вниманию доклад небольшой на тему интересов регионов в процессе формирования законодательства в области использования атомной энергии. Так получилось, что проблемы в законодательстве я исследую уже достаточно продолжительное время, и э, одно из наблюдений сводится к тому, что не всегда учитывается роль регионов, интересы регионов при принятии решений, в том числе связанных с использованием атомной энергии, как по размещению объектов использования атомной энергии, так и вопросы, касающиеся декомиссии, то есть вывода из эксплуатации объектов, выработавших свой ресурс. С одной стороны, законодательство закрепляет полномочия регионов, я имею в виду субъектов Российской Федерации, в области использования атомной энергии, в области обеспечения ядерной, радиационной безопасности. Есть соответствующие положения, как в законе об использовании атомной энергии, в законе о радиационной безопасности населения, ну и ряде других нормативных актов. А с другой стороны, эти полномочия сводятся лишь к техническим моментам, к моментам обязанности информировать население, но интересы самих регионов они остаются вне поля зрения законодателя. Хотя полномочия такие присутствуют и в сфере выработки определенных норм в области той же ядерной радиационной безопасности при согласовании строительства, ну, проектирования сначала, затем строительства некоторых объектов на той или иной территории, ну и многие другие. Основные, конечно, полномочия принадлежат Российской Федерации. У нас Конституция закрепила предмет исключительно ведения Российской Федерации вопроса атомной энергетики. Но вопросы, связанные с использованием природных ресурсов, с охраной окружающей среды, это предмет совместного вения. То есть здесь субъекты Российской Федерации регулируют эти отношения. И а, нередко изменение законодательства а, сводится к изменению только нормативной базы, а, федеральной нормативной базы. 
То есть есть несколько этапов да, принятия нового закона или изменения существующего. Ну, на первом этапе, если мы говорим о принятии нового закона, то вырабатывается некая концепция изменения закона или принятия нового. Эта концепция основана на реальной потребности регулирования тех или иных отношений. И а, вот а, наше предложение наших общественных объединений, представители которых сегодня присутствуют, сводится к тому, что уже на этом этапе, когда вырабатывается, нет еще проекта изменения даже закона, а вырабатывается некая концепция а, изменения законодательства, то нужно а, здесь уже а, вести диалог с регионами, с населением, заинтересованной общественностью, дабы учесть интересы субъектов Российской Федерации. И я бы хотел остановиться сейчас на трех принципах, которые важно учитывать при составлении этой концепции, ну и в дальнейшем написании проекта нормативного акта, согласования этого нормативного акта и принятия нормативного акта в окончательной форме. Но эти принципы, они не новы, они закреплены в действующем законодательстве, но ими, к сожалению, не так часто пользуются. Первый принцип – это научно обоснованное сочетание экологических, и экономических и социальных интересов человека в целях обеспечения устойчивого развития и благоприятной окружающей среды. Это необходимый принцип, это основа, в том числе ядерной радиационной безопасности, потому что без гармонизации этих сторон, то есть экономической стороны, социальной, экологической стороны, не будет никакого развития общества и не будет обеспечена ядерной и радиационной безопасности. Дальше необходимо руководствоваться при принятии каких-то нормативных актов или их изменений принципом соблюдения права на благоприятную окружающую среду, это конституционное право, и также принцип. То есть вытекает из этого права – это гарантия и соблюдение этого права. И также есть еще взаимосвязанный принцип – это учет природных и социально-экономических особенностей территорий. То есть каждая территория уникальна в своем отношении к другим территориям. И вот принцип учета природных и социально-экономических особенностей территории он также закреплен у нас в законе. И почему это важно? Нередко у нас интересы не совпадают. Я имею в виду федеральные в лице крупной корпорации, в нашем случае это Росатом, да? и интересы региональные. То есть интересы корпорации Росатом сводятся к оптимизации некой процессов, к удешевлению. И эти вот тенденции, они ну, в корне противоречат, по сути, интересам населения, проживающих на соответствующей территории. То есть в законах субъектов Российской Федерации необходимо закрепить вот это благо, этот интерес конкретного региона, в том числе и в сфере использования атомной энергии. И баланс вот этих интересов очень важен, потому что если ну, закон просто будет насаждаться, да, мнение регионов не учитывается, исполнять такой закон ну, достаточно сложно. И вот принцип учета социальных особенностей, экологических особенностей, он должен быть прописан обязательно в региональном законодательстве и федеральном законодательстве, он также должен быть детализирован, потому что сейчас это только принцип, но не, нет механизма реализации этого принципа. Я уже остановился на полномочиях регионов, в том числе и принятии нормативных актов. И вот такой процесс, он достаточно широко развивается, такой процесс, он естественный. И в регионах, в субъектах принимаются различные законы, в том числе об использовании атомной энергии, но он по-другому называется. В основном законы сводится к обеспечению ядерной радиационной безопасности. Если быть более точным, то только к радиационной безопасности. То есть закон о радиационной безопасности населения есть во многих регионах. 
там, в Челябинской области в том числе, в Архангельской, ну и в, ряд, в ряде других регионов. Это базовый закон. И а, при принятии таких законов я говорю, на региональном уровне а, нормативная база, то есть этот закон должен учитывать и корректировать недостатки федеральных нормативных актов. Он должен детализировать те моменты, которые так или иначе в федеральных законах не прописаны. И как раз интересы регионов должны быть ну, выражены и выработаны в конкретных законодательно закрепленных принципах и механизмах реализации. Но вот тот же принцип учета общественного мнения. Да, он прописан, но механизм этого учета, он остается ну, достаточно сложно осуществим. Ну и также важно для реализации права граждан на участие в формировании политики в области охраны окружающей среды предупользования использовать ну, наивысшее, наивысшее волеизъявление и учет общественного мнения, учет общего мнения населения, я имею в виду институт референдума, потому что это действительно высшее непосредственное выражение власти народа. И решение референдума можно преодолеть только иным решением. С одной стороны, это юридически значимое событие, но и с другой стороны, проведение регионального референдума ну, по вопросу, например, с размещением новых опасных объектов использования атомной энергии или, допустим, остановки, Атомный энергоблока, статья 33 закона об использовании атомной энергии Российской Федерации предусматривает досрочное остановление энергоблоков, не только выработать свой ресурс. И вот такие решения, принятые на референдумы, не только бы позволили реализовать конституционное право граждан на волю изъявления, но и придать такому решению высшую юридическую силу и, соответственно, ответственность тех регионов, за принятое вот решение. Ну, в своем докладе я лишь очертил вот общие рамки реализации права граждан на участие в принятии решений, в том числе и в сфере использования атомной энергии, ну и общие рамки организации законодательного процесса на уровне регионов. Надеюсь, что ну, на практике а такие процессы будут осуществляться чаще, и права граждан, в том числе на радиационную безопасность, и на благоприятную окружающую среду, будут гарантироваться и соблюдаться как федеральными органами власти, так и органами государственной власти субъектов Российской Федерации. Спасибо. And right on time. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to give the uh, last word before Q and A session uh, to to Henrietta. And so Henrietta, the floor is yours once again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. I say amen to what my Russian colleague has just laid out. These are wonderful principles and may they be realized. Um, I'm to talk, I, I'm talking about the challenges to citizen engagement and our experience in Plymouth. So uh, I wanna start by just saying that I think one of the biggest challenges to overcome is simply that the word nuclear conjures fear. It's invisible, abstract and terrifying and nobody wants to linger on it. But there, that's a challenge. But the, the next challenge is for a host town that is hosting a nuclear plant. Um, there is a challenge because the, the company spreads money very liberally around, encouraging or might we say manufacturing consent. When Boston Edison's Pilgrim landed in Plymouth in 1972, the town's coffers suddenly overflowed and company largesse benefited everyone, citizens and institutions alike, library, rotary club, churches, even land trusts. The town was literally giddy with tax relief. Do you bite the hand that feeds you? In 1936, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
observed that business, among other enemies of peace, has come to think of the government as a mere appendage. And this continues, this conflict between the needs of the people for health and welfare and the needs of business for profit frames much of our American history. But responsible citizens are desperately needed to subdue corporate greed and assure proper government regulatory attention so that decommission will leave us safe. This means understanding the importance of your vote. Um, the governor, the attorney general, and, the, and their values matter. The laws of the state matter. Local legislators matter. Responsible journalists matter. We need them and they need us to ar articulate our concerns. Here in Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis was the last governor to pay serious attention to Pilgrim and to prioritize citizen safety. And since he left office approximately three decades ago, our governments have mostly prioritized business concerned over, over nuclear safety. But three years ago, as Attorney General, Maura Healy, now our governor, negotiated a strong settlement agreement with Holtec and she has the power to assert and enforce it. And she's made some encouraging statements. So now we hold our breath. Meanwhile, citizen engagement requires watchdogs, organizers, researchers, scholars, lawyers, communicators, and rabble rousers. And we have all of them in one form or another. In the 1960s, Plymouth was lucky enough to have a hero, a lawyer named Bill Abbott who mounted a successful opposition to his second reactor, and that was a minor miracle. During the plant's operation, citizen interests would be briefly be awakened by news of an accident or an unexpected shutdown or a, a storm, a leak, reports of safety infraction. This happened often because Pilgrim ranked among the three most dangerous plants in the nation. But by the time I arrived here, in 2015 from the West Coast, Plymouth activists had sub suffered burnout and the only significant watchdogs and organizers were outside of Plymouth. Diane Turco and Harwich, a natural grassroots activist, had founded Cape Down Winders and was busy raising consciousness all across the Cape. And meanwhile, in Duxbury, just north of Plymouth, Mary Lampert, watchdog, watchdog extraordinaire, had made it her business to learn everything she could about Pilgrim's operation. And then she wrote the definitive handbook on it. Both women grasped the importance of cultivating relationships with legislators to encourage helpful legislation. Now, when the plant shut down, the public exhaled, danger over, don't have to think about that anymore. How do you make them aware that it's not over? To catch citizen interest, you need a hook. And at Pilgrim, probably for obvious reasons, it turned out to be the water, which galvanized public interest. In early December of 2021, our federal representative, Bill Keating, received a mistaken email. I mean, an email sent unconsciously, apparently, from the NRC affirming that Holtec was preparing to dump it's nuclear wastewater straight into our Cape Cod Bay, and that this would happen imminently in the first quarter of 2022. This came as a shock to Representative Keating because a week earlier at the meeting of the oversight panel, Holtec had hedged all questions about the water and claimed that all options were still very much under consideration. Keating leaked the news to the press and suddenly the press, the, the public sprang to life especially in the fishing community, oystermen, fish, finned fishermen, lobstermen, and so forth. Public, uh, slide number two, please. Public outrage at the news of the proposed dumping inspired the formation of an ad hoc, ad hoc organization called Save Our Bay. And I've, I've miswritten it up there. It should say saveourbayma.com because that's specific to Massachusetts. Our mission is stated, keep Cape Cod Bay clean. 
it's a stakeholder coalition of conservation groups, industry groups, local leaders, concerned citizens, all organized around that single goal of stopping Holtec and or any of its subsidiaries from releasing or discarding any materials from the closed Pilgrim nuclear power station into Cape Cod Bay or any nearby water source or drainage systems. And all the actions taken by our coalition will be to this end. And here at the right, you can see quite a broad range of, of organizations from the League of Women Voters to the Mass uh, Peace Alliance to Mass Perg to uh, the Wampanoag Herring, Herring Pond Wampanoag community and uh, many others, Sierra Club and so forth. Uh, next slide. Local graphic artists help us spread the word. We love and we need our graphic artists. They've also helped us with a trifold with various flyers and merchandise that helps publicize the cause, shirts, bumper stickers, lawn signs, and the like. And these are just a smattering of many more flyers that you can see. On to the next slide, please. Here are some of the ways we've rallied citizens to make our voices heard. At the top, you see a standout right next to Plymouth Rock in the rain. And over here to the right, there is a rally at Coles Hill just across from the rock. Below right and left, you see standouts in the vicinity of Plymouth Town Hall and all, all seasons, cold and hot, rain and shine. In the middle, you'll note a truck with a large digital sign. This truck joined a standout back in spring when Union 721 was locked out of Holtec Pilgrim because of an abrupt change in management. Holtec's subsidiary, CDI, parted company with its Canadian partner, SNC-Lavalin, and thereby breached its original contract with the union. So the union balked at signing a new contract with different provisions, and they were summarily locked out and are now in litigation with Holtec. Next slide, please. Next slide, yes. Um, concern legislators proposed an oversight committee the intention was to engage and empower the citizen's voice. So it was, and I should have put the, the, the meaning of this acronym at the top, it is the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Committee. That bill around 2017 passed, but last minute machinations behind closed doors on Beacon Hill undercut the goal of citizen empowerment. The changes gave three votes to Pilgrim's owner operator, which was then Entergy, and then it shifted to Holtec, two in management and one, in one vote to Pilgrim's union representative. The panel was further hamstrung because state ex officio members could not vote. Consequently, citizens on the panel are very few. We cannot give policy advice because the composition of the panel stymies the possibility of a quorum or a successful vote. Nevertheless, the panel does serve as an essential documentation and an opportunity for some citizen engagement. It is filmed for the record and the pu public gets to speak most typically for the last 20 minutes of the meeting. Occasionally nuggets of information also leak out of this panel. For several years we met once a month, now it's once every other month. Uh, and it attracted very few members of the public, except for those obsessed, because the meetings can be stultifying. But the water issue galvanized the community, especially those professionally engaged in fishing, marine recreation, and real estate, as well as environmental protection. This past year meetings have been dynamic and even tumultuous. This is much more impressive because with few exceptions, the public has had to wait for two hours or almost two hours until the last 20 minutes before making comments, by which time everyone is thoroughly exhausted. But top left, you see a fisherman, Ryan Collins, who presented, he initiated a petition on change.org and got 20 
I'm sorry, it should say 200, 200,000 signatures. This is a mistake on my slide. 200,000 signatures. Uh, and he presented the printed out version to the whole tech compliance manager who sits on the panel. Uh, it didn't make much of a, an impact on the compliance manager, but it did among the public. Um, below him, you see a photo of a young Manomet resident and Boy Scout, Timmy Bennett, who came with his mother and neighbors to speak about his own worries for the future and for his generation because of the legacy of nuclear power. Um, behind him, against the wall, you'll notice these beautiful blue t-shirts, which have the logo of Save Our Bay Mass on them. Um, that was a night when there was standing room only at the town hall where these NDCAP meetings are, are take place. Um, to the right, you see lawyer James Lampert from Duxbury querying the compliance manager last <clears throat> summer. A couple months later, Mr. Uh, Lampert was appointed to the NDCAP himself, and he has helped to build the citizen citizen voice a little bit more on the panel. Next um, slide. We are lucky. Could we have the next slide, please? We are lucky to work with legislators. We, we cultivate our legislators, federal and state, who are committed to keeping us safe and Holtec accountable. A month, a year ago this month, Senator Ed Markey brought his subcommittee, his federal subcommittee to Plymouth for a field hearing. This was really unprecedented. He and Representative Keating grilled Holtec CEO, Chris Singh, as well as a representative of the NRC and three other notables. Chris Singh was zoomed in larger than life from I believe Jupiter Island where he lives. And we watched a <laughs> dazzling display of verbal gamesmanship, which is still, just a minute or so. Okay, still playing out today in correspondence with Holtec. And this helped us understand who and what we are dealing with. Here to the left, you see Senator Moran, who often speaks at the start of our meetings. And to the right, State Representative Kathleen Lenatra, representing North Plymouth and Kingston, preparing to speak at a rally outside town hall prior to an NDCAP meeting. Um, our fed reps, our federal reps usually send top staffers to the panel meetings, and we are grateful. State legislature, legislators that we work with have introduced bills with the hope of halting Holtec's plans to dump. Those from last year failed, but we are hopeful for efforts for, for this year. Stay tuned. In the seven years that I have fo followed Pilgrim-related legislation, the only bill to make it through legislator, state legislature was the one funding the dissemination of KI pills, which are no longer even relevant because that's for the possibility of an, uh, of an explosion and thyroid issues uh, can be taken care of with KI pills, but not relevant anymore. Um, the nuclear industry has a very potent army of lobbyists and lawyers, and even with citizens engaged, legislation can be an uphill battle. But now we have the settlement. Henrietta, we've got it. We've got to wrap up and save some time for questions here. Okay, um, we are praying that our settlement agreement will help <laughs> us to halt Holtec, and this depends on enforcement. And hope is not a plan, so we maintain activity because, again, better active than radioactive. Thank you, Henrietta. And, you know, I think we, we've covered a tremendous amount of ground here uh, in, in some disparate kind of ways. Um, and let's 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 make the most of our Q&A period here. Uh, I'll ask people if we can kind of hang in uh, until the uh, top of the hour. Uh, uh, Saving me a couple minutes to wrap up, but uh, Q&A and turn it over to Linda and Nat now. Thanks, Joe. And just a reminder to the audience, we're not using the raise hand function. So if you have raised your hand, uh, feel free to lower it. You need to put your question in written form 
into the Q&A and that's where we'll be taking them. Um, I have one uh, particular question that I came in earlier actually for you, Alec, which I'd like to ask you. And then I think a more general question that perhaps will go to all of our panelists and, and feel free to uh, answer that one. But the question uh, to you, Alec, was from Mitchell Marik and it was about the decommissioning plan specifically for the Leningrad nuclear power plant and whether the plans include dismantlement, whether these plants will be completely taken apart. So he just wanted to know a little bit more about when the, the ones that are decommissioning at Leningrad, what actually happens there? Oops, we lose all again. Существует концепция по выводу из эксплуатации, существует программа вывода из эксплуатации, они опубликованы. Не опубликованы, но они доступны нашей организации. Согласно этим документам планируется вывод из эксплуатации до состояния коричневой лужайки. Это имеется в виду, что будут оставлены отдельные здания, помещения для того, чтобы их использовать для других целей. Процесс вывода из эксплуатации планируется примерно на столько же лет, сколько работала станция. На сегодняшний день в проекте концепции, вернее, в концепции описано, что этот процесс будет продолжаться до 2059 года. В течение этого времени будут проводиться работы по дезактивации, и отработавшее ядерное топливо планируется переместить отсюда, с берега Балтики, на берег Енисея, в Сибирь. И Процесс должен закончиться в 2059 году, но на сегодняшний день объявлено, что закрытие, окончательная остановка третьего и четвертого энергоблока будет невозможно в те сроки, которые ранее опубликованы, потому что новые блоки, которые должны заменить выводимые из эксплуатации, не будут построены к 2025 году. Поэтому третий и четвертый блоки будут работать еще 5 лет. То есть вся станция вместо 30 лет проектного ресурса планирует эксплуатировать 50 лет. Поэтому и вывод из эксплуатации будет, по всей видимости, продлен еще на 5 лет, то есть до 2065 года. И вот такие планы. Еще одна проблема, что отсутствуют деньги, ресурсы, которые потребуются для вывода. Это будут платить будущие поколения. Спасибо. Thanks, Alex. Sorry, a bit of a delay there and getting my mute back off. Um, I, I do want to just, I think, given the time is running out, sort of encapsulate some of the things we've all heard today and some of the questions that haven't been answered in a more uh, general approach, because what I've been hearing and, and, and feel, and I'd love to reintroduce uh, Deb as well, and some of the voices we heard at the beginning and Andre uh, in particular, on this one, uh, because we've talked a lot about the control that the industry and the regulator have over the decommissioning process in both our countries. And, and, and we've also talked, and Andre and you in particular, about the principles that need to be in place in order to protect our environment and public health. And we've also heard from Sarah and from Henriette and others some great, and uh, you know, some of the great stories about what we as civil society have already been able to do um, to improve this a little bit. But what the missing piece seems to be that our politicians also lack power. They are also overridden 
by the control of the industry and the regulator together. So I would love to hear from each of you how we can all better work with, pressure, cajole our political leaders into challenging this industry regulator control because they after all are answerable to us, their constituents. They are supposed to be there to safeguard the environment in which we all live in our respective states or towns. So um, I, I just would love to know what you all think about the changing the political uh, dynamic. And, and maybe we'll start with Deb and then we'll go to Andre if you would like to answer that, Andre. And then if there's time, you know, the others can chime in. Thank you. Look, I just want to go back to something I said, because I think it's really, it pre presents a context of where we are. There, the colossal failure of nuclear power is demonstrated in decommissioning, because suddenly this clean technology is really dirty. And the only way the industry can continue with its claims is to contaminate America. And the NRC helps with this by making the process more and more opaque as more and more waste has to be sent somewhere. And I want to go back to the notion of states' rights, because I think at this point, states have to pressure, just as we have to pressure state legislators Le legislators, legislators have to pressure the federal government and their and our senators and their senators to actually start being responsible for the problem. And I'll give an example quickly. Massachusetts is surrounded by four reactors. Our little state, three of them downed, one open, four high-level waste dumps, and a lot of waste that's still on site. And there is, the, and we've been abandoned. I mean, we don't even matter in this discussion at all because it's just what the industry wants and what the regulators let them do. But in fact, the state needs to take on this issue and protect our communities. And that includes, and I raised it, the issues of going back to providing support for our communities. There was in the federal legislation, the Stranded Act, which was to give money to react to communities where the where it had closed. But I think it needs to go beyond money. It has to go to protecting the irradiated fuel and the community from terrorism. It has to go to climate disruption and, and the vulnerability of these sites to disasters that are now increasing day by day and also to provide support just for these communities in a reasonable way. They are living with broken promises and are invisible. We have been lied to and no one is protecting us. No one is even acknowledging that this is a problem and it is immoral and irresponsible. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. And we'll, I know that Alec has his hand up too. We'll go to Andre first if you have, if you would like to respond to Andre and then to Alec. Хорошо, спасибо, Линда, за предоставленное слово. Ну, вообще, я восхищен той работой, которую проделывают вот, американские друзья, коллеги, за тот, тот опыт, который уже существует. Прекрасный там результат, вот Сара Абрамсон рассказывала про них. Я очень рад за вас и прям держу кулачки, продолжайте также дальше действовать. Что касается, как работать дальше, что делать, ну, я здесь бы три момента отметил буквально. Я считаю, что генеральной нашей линией это все-таки является работа с населением, работа с обществом, тех именно жителей, где находятся эти ядерные объекты. Если мы не будем нести ценности, если мы не будем пропагандировать вот эти все ценности благоприятной окружающей среды, соблюдения прав, и не будем в доступной форме доносить их, у нас будет очень слабая поддержка, и все, все остальное оно постепенно будет уже не так важно. Мы будем проигрывать постоянно. Поэтому 
Да, проблемы с радиоактивными отходами, интересы населения. Вот все эти вот простые тезисы мы должны простым языком доносить до населения. Конечно, люди все уже опытные, работают не один десяток лет, все знают какие-то, имеют, знают, имеют знания, компетенции, все вот обращения в суд, работа с депутатами, работа со средствами массовой информации – это наши инструменты, но основа – это вот все те ценности, которые нужны обществу, не компаниям, они у них другие ценности, а обществу. И вот этот инструментарий, ну, включая вот наше общение, да, обмен опытом, мы должны его расширять, пользоваться теми вот, достижениями, которые наши коллеги достигли, и тем самым лоббировать да, интересы, на интересы общества, по сути, потому что мы выразители этих интересов, лоббировать и в органах власти, в органах местного самоуправления, законы принимать, свои предлагать. То есть все это верно. И э, третий момент. Э, необходимо также работать с молодежью. Потому что, к сожалению, э, вот становится все меньше и меньше мостиков между старшим поколением и молодежью. Нужно обращать внимание, что молодежь немножко по-другому воспринимает тот мир, который их окружает. И в том числе угрозы, которые несет атомная энергетика, для них по-другому. И мы должны вот этот фактор учитывать, потому что следующие общественники, это вот будут такие молодые адвокаты, как в Соединенных Штатах Америки выступают, это будет молодежь, а они, у них другой инструментарий, у них маленькое другое сознание, и на это мы тоже должны обратить внимание. Спасибо. Thank you, Andre. So we have five minutes left, I think, Joe, on your clock. So uh, we'll go to maybe to Alec and Sarah. Just... Мне представляется, что атомщики говорят о безопасности технологических решений, что техника хорошая, но при этом у нас недостаточно информации от ученых, которые изучают состояние природы, состояние природных экосистем. И мне представляется, что очень важно создать независимую от атомщиков и публично работающую научные лаборатории, которые изучают те изменения, которые происходят рядом с атомными станциями. И если это удастся сделать, то мне представляется, что новое поколение и те жители, которые живут рядом, будут знать о состоянии природы и о возможных последствиях для здоровья людей. То есть нам нужно измерять температуру природы, а не бороться с атомщиками. Мы создадим новое пространство для такого давления на атомщиков, и это может дать хороший результат, так мне кажется. Спасибо. Sarah, why don't you go ahead? And Paul, if you want to chime in with the last word too, I don't want to leave you out of this conversation. Henrietta, I know you wrapped up, so we'll probably skip you and just wrap this up after Sarah or Paul. Thanks, Linda. Um, I wanted to maybe provide some specifics when we're talking about instruments and strategies. And in, it's definitely a multi-generational uh, strategy. So we've a lot of, I came into this role just last June and you know, have immersed myself and most of my comrades in this fight are a couple generations from me. And um, you've been doing it for so long and so well, um, but there is maybe a cohort of folks that aren't accessible because they don't use the same communication strategies that are being used. If you look at TikTok, and the nuclear now movie that just came out 
there's a person on there who has garnered millions of young people following her that is, she is their sole source of information for nuclear. And so that's, we need to start framing our strategies in a much more innovative way if we want to keep up with the propaganda machines. Um, and I also want to encourage, uh, when we talk about your original question, Linda, about how to connect with legislators, um, we're a community that has an active nuclear power plant, but decommissioning is inevitable, right? So we keep these relationships by scheduling regular briefings with the, the aides, you know, don't only contact them when you have a big problem, just have like a monthly regular. Um, they'll come to you before they come to someone else. So you'll be like the first one, you'll have an in. Um, and I'd also encourage, you know, use of all, all the social media platforms, but also, you know, connect with each other, reshare each other's posts, create the perception that this is a big network. Um, because right now, you know, you can look at our, our program and you can say, wow, all these 12 organizations are working together for this webinar. But in reality, we're, we, we work together constantly behind the scenes. And with mm -hmm. that collect, I think from the perception of a, of a politician, um, if it's more clear in your brand that you are interconnected with dozens of other groups in your region, um, then that's like voting power. How many of my constituents care about this issue? Um, and so really translating for policymakers Voters equal you having this job next term and voters care about this. I've talked to them. This is how many people subscribe to my newsletter. This is how many people uh, follow my social media pages. So really getting hitting the ground running and keeping up with just driving up those um, those numbers because it's going to be the that's going to be the factor that impacts how much a politician pays attention to you. Mm. Yes. So, Joe, I don't know whether, Paul, do you want to have a quick last no, word? I just want to say thank you, and I'm going to defer to Joe. Good. All yours, Joe. Okay, I'm, I'm... Here we go. So I'm not going to try to summarize what was a very uh, rich... Uh, I need to unmute myself again here, all right? So I'm not going to try to summarize what was a rich discussion of, of three hours, uh, but I do want to say that I experienced this as a beginning, not an end, uh, that, that we've uh, developed some important relationships. We've covered some interesting ground. Uh, we have a lot more to learn from one another. Uh, and, you know, in unity, there is strength. Uh, so So I'm looking forward to uh, frankly, to the debriefing meeting that uh, the planners of this session uh, will have, uh, and to see uh, what we what we chart for the future. Uh, I want to be very um, uh, clear to uh, thank uh, our interpreter, uh, Jana, uh, to uh, thank all of our speakers who uh, did a lot of preparation uh, and gave us some really excellent uh, talks in developing what I think will be an important resource. Uh, it doesn't stop here. This has been recorded. It will be a valuable resource for people, uh, I think, in, in, in both of our countries. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Sean Connor uh, from the International Peace Bureau, uh, who stepped into a bit of a breach uh, and um, uh, who has made, made today's uh, session possible. I think the, the last thing I want to say, and maybe the, 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 the ultimate lesson here uh, for me, uh, is something that uh, former UN uh, General Secretary Ban Ki-moon said in relationship to nuclear weapons, which I think applies equally to, to nuclear power and nuclear power plants. He, he told a large gathering that governments are not going to deliver you um, uh, the abolition of nuclear weapons just as governments are not about to deliver us uh, the abolition or necessarily the safety of nuclear power plants. That can only come from pressure from below, from popular action, as, uh, as Sarah and, and Henrietta, uh, Andre and others have been, been, been talking about. And so I hope that in, in some ways, uh, this session, in addition to its information sharing, will also serve to inspire people to uh, keep on doing the important work and expand the work of building that pressure from below uh, because our safety and the safety of future generations absolutely depends on it. 
So I want to thank everybody and look forward to our future work together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can stop the recording here. And